Our last speaker, Dr. Mark S. Uh, Marcouli, is Dean and Professor of the School of Theology and Ministry at Seattle University. Dr. Marcouli teaches in the areas of religion and culture, the psychology of religion, and religious education. He has a reputation for creating educational programs that bring together people of different religious traditions to overcome their misunderstandings and find common ground on important issues. Dr. Marcouli has a Bachelor Degree in Journalism from the University of Missouri School of Journalism, a Master Degree in Systemic Theology from Aquinas Institute of Theology, and a PhD in Education from St. Louis University. The title of Dr. Marcouli's presentation is How the Private Good of Religion Becomes a Public Good for Society. You know, you all have been sitting there for quite a while. Would you like to stand up for just a minute? Get a little blood flowing? So let me begin this way. Uh, you know, I work at a university. And, can you hear me? I, I work at a university, and, and universities, we're, we're always trying to engage in different types of debates. So, so let me frame one for you as we begin this discussion. Th thesis one. Believing in and practicing a religious tradition will have positive effects on your life. Your marriage will last longer. You will stay healthier. You will live longer and trend happier in daily living. Your children will negotiate the transition from childhood to adulthood with less drama. For any of us with teenage kids, that's really helpful to know. <laughs> if you become seriously ill, you will increase your odds of surviving, and you will accumulate more wealth over the course of your working life. Thesis two, believing in and practicing a religion will have negative effects on your life. It will amplify the human tendency toward prejudicial beliefs. It will fill your inner world with a fear that will erode your health. It will predispose you to superstition and the inability to discern truth from fiction. It will doom you to poor financial decision making and make you susceptible to charlatans and snake oil salespeople. It will incite your baser human passions, make you more reactive, so, and so you distort your inner world uh, so much that you will miss out on the best things life has to offer and subvert the foundations of a democratic republic. If you were in a class at Seattle University where we prize ourselves on teaching students how to research issues, think critically about them, decide a position on an issue carefully, and marshal argu arguments to defend that position honestly, you would have a much easier time defending thesis number one than thesis number two. This is not because Seattle University is a religiously informed institution, which of course we are. It is because we live in a, in a really unique time in which the research from many fields is showing increasingly that religion is, overall, a good force in your life. The data is coming from all kinds of sources that once did not think very positively about religion the biological and neurological sciences, sociology, psychology, and even cognitive science. Religion gives meaning to our life, it helps us find our location in the world, and helps us interpret and respond to the uncertainties of reality. Religion can help us enjoy the good things in our life at a deeper level, and it can empower us to endure and overcome the bad things with hope, determination, humor, grace, and integrity. It can also teach us to value something that is bigger than everything else. It can impregnate our life with a depth of meaning that empowers us to literally overcome basic instincts, including fear of suffering and fear of death. Now, of course, how good religion is for you depends on your particular religious belief and practice. It also depends on the health and balance of the religious community in which you live. But all things being equal, if you live a religious, exp uh, 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 religious existence, it will net good results in your life. Without a doubt, religion is a private good. In the past few decades, it is also becoming clear to many people who once thought religion a superstitious throwback to our cave days that religion is, is a public good as well. Historians, political scientists, and even of all things, economists 
are realizing that religion operating in the right way in the nation's debate over the common good is beneficial to society. And this is just not happening in the U.S. John Mecklethwaite and Adrian Wold Wooldridge, two writers for the British magazine The Economist, wrote a book a number of years ago called God is Back, How the Global Revival of Faith is Changing the World. The premise is the smart money buried God and religion in the 1960s. But by the 1970s, they, were both, they both came roaring back. And we are much the better for it. Uh, one of them, I won't say which one, is an atheist. The other is kind of a lukewarm believer in something. So these are not people who are trying to proselytize in any way. David Aikman uh, authored a book a number of years ago as well called Jesus in Beijing. And he notes that the, the Chinese Communist Party has turned a blind eye toward enthusiastic religious practice in certain cities in China because they have noticed that communities with more religious fervor actually have a more vibrant economy. From, from Nelson Mandela uh, to, and, and Mohandas Gandhi in India, to Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, to, to Malala Yousafzai in Pakistan, um, the past seven years have shown that people of religious conviction and passion are capable of bringing religious principles into the public square in ways that make the world a little more just and a little more humane. Although some have tried to rewrite American history during the same period of the past 20 or 30 years that a lot of this research has come out, the founders of the US saw this clearly dating all the way back to the first president. In Washington's famous farewell address, he warned the nation that it needed to protect two primary sources for political prosperity. One was morality and the other was religion. And he saw these two pillars of human happiness, as he referred to it, so conjoined that without religion, the moral fiber of the nation would collapse. This fundamental stream of thought in American democracy was forgotten through much of the 19th and 20th centuries when American and European societies went through a long process of trying to privatize religion, driving it out of the public square and into the private lives of people only. But the older American appreciation for the potential good of religion is returning. Part of the reason this is happening is that it, it is a matter of public record in the US that most of the great social movements in the US began in houses of prayer. Abolition, child labor laws, the worker movement, women's rights, all of them started, and many more of the, the major social movements all started in religious institutions, people meeting in rooms much like this. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham has written a beautiful book called Righteous Discontent, The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church, 1880 to 1920. Doesn't sound like a page turner, but I guarantee you it is. She tells the story of heroic and savvy women who, turned, who, who decided to turn black churches into schools of public virtue and social consciousness in order to advance the race and to make American society more just. In the process, these remarkable women quietly changed their faith communities into powerhouses of personal and neighborhood transformation. A young black boy in the South who grew up in the American Baptist Church structures, uh, he grew up in the, the American Baptist Church structures that these remarkable women built. Uh, in this structure, he learned to weave together with passion the sacred texts of his religious tradition with the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and Bill of Rights. Um, and he ended up bringing his faith and politics together in a way that honored democratic principles and religious commitment in a new way. His name, of course, was Martin Luther King Jr. And he ultimately sur surrendered his life in the cause of racial equality and justice. Religion was a private good for him. It was a private good for his entire family. But he grew, uh, he grew up into making it a catalyst for demonstrating to millions of people worldwide how religion can become a public good as well. Dr. King and the women who built the religious communities that, that gave him his education are by no means, means solitary examples of the private good of religious belief and practice bursting out into the community in forms of public good. The U.S. has no patent on religion as a public good. 
Similarly motivated Islamic women and men are working throughout Egypt, Iran, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, and Turkey, attempting to bring the good forces of the religious belief and practice of the Islamic tradition into a type of harmony with political, social, and economic realities of the place in which they live. These nations <coughs> excuse me, that have an Islamic majority have to struggle against the, the distorted uh, structures left from the colonial era. Uh, much of the African American women and men, Dr. King, uh, uh, had been had been formed by also needed to find their way through the limiting realities of Jim Crow legislation, the ultimate rigged system. This is a process and a and a and a phenomena that actually is worldwide. The names change, the dynamics change because some of the political structures and the history are different. But there are there are common patterns that exist through uh, all of these countries and including within our own. In the US, if religious communities want to find effective ways to bring the wisdom of their traditions into debates, to debates in the commons, it's important to understand America's tradition and balance between religion and society. And I hope that based on these kinds of conversations that Islam finds a more fruitful and a more visible way of being able to make the contributions of, of Islamic values and insights to become more a, a bigger part of the common uh, uh, good conversations that we have within the U.S. That is that is the goal of this. Um, a good a good source for this kind of uh, understanding of how this dynamic works is John Meacham's book, The American Gospel, and in it he explains how the founders, especially J Thomas Jefferson, tried to stake out this liminal place between the for what the way he puts it the ferocity of the evangelizing Christians on the one side and the contempt for religion of secular philosophes, mostly influenced in France, on the other. Meacham believes the good news of the American gospel is that the nation has been shaped by religion without allowing religion to strangle the political and economic life of the state. Excessive religious influence and excessive secularism for the founders were both bad. In the U.S., they've, they've been kept in balance. Well, sort of. For instance, most Americans don't know that the first treaty in the U.S. was signed in 1797 by President John Adams and that the treaty was with the Muslim nation of Tripoli. In the treaty, Adams stated clearly that the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. But you can't see this by looking through the 19th and 20th century. The early years of the nation had excesses on both sides of the secularism, religious uh, uh, extremist um, pol polarities. And it's one of the reasons that the political leadership that set the system up is increasingly being considered to be, have been so brilliant to create these systems of checks and balances. I think most contemporary scholars of religion in the public square would agree with Adams this is not, was not formed as a Christian nation. Many have liked to think of America as a Christian nation, and while Christianity has certainly been the dominant religious tradition for most of our history, the United States is something actually different. There was a Catholic uh, public theologian, public writer named G.K. Chesterton in the late 19th, early 20th century, and I think Chesterton from his position in Great Britain actually caught something about the United States long before most people here did. He ended up saying that America is a nation that is founded on its own religious creed, the Declaration of Independence. The U.S. is an imagined community built around not language and custom, but rather ideas and values. And these ideas and values have given, have given us much uh, as much, these ideas and values have been given as much legitimating and integrating force as religion has. So in a very real way for any religious tradition to enter into the common goods discussion in the public square, it's important to realize that it is, it is a form of interreligious dialogue. It is a form of interreligious dialogue with a civil religion which we could spend all our time talking about, which we don't have. But that's kind of the frame on the way that I would look at how um, what we hope will come out of this conference and others like it uh, will actually play out. We need to think in terms of our religious traditions being in dialogue with another religious tradition 
that comes out of a, a, a values and ideas framework that many people have wrongly interpreted as being purely secular. It actually never was. For the private good of religion to become a public good in society, we have to become not only masters of our own religious tradition, but also our culture, its languages, its metaphors, the way that it, it thinks about itself. More importantly, we have to learn how to work at harmonizing the four publics that religious wisdom must address. And I'd like to kind of take you through these four publics in the hopes that we can feel good about the fact that some of the challenges that we've had and that the, the Islamic community has encountered in this nation, that there is hope that we can do something about it. Many of us already are, but actually we need a more holistic strategy and awareness of how actually moving the needle on some of the things that we've been, been talking about actually can come about. And that's only gonna come about, I think, I would argue, by us being uh, very, very strategic in dealing with these four publics. So here are the publics, and they're borrowed in part from a theologian named David Tracy, who's at the University of Chicago. Tracy believes there are three publics for religion. The academy, there you go. The academy, the public of higher learning and intellectual debate about religious ideas. The second public, is the religious community or congregation, and this is the public of religion's most intimate intersection with human living, where we interface with people of our, of our um, shared religious belief and practice. And then society, the public of our common life with those who think and believe and feel like we do, and those who do not. I would add one more public to this. The public that uh, has been ignored for too often by people who want to take, who want to do public theology, who want to, to, to somehow make the world a more just and humane world, and maybe who have been active with these three publics that Tracy talks about. That fourth public, I would call our families, our extended families, the professional friends and coworkers at our place of employment, and the people we encounter in our recreational and community relational networks. And I'll talk just a little bit about that. First, the academy. Tracy sees the academy as the primary place where religions do their serious thinking. Um, it is the place where religious traditions can rethink themselves for each generation and each new moral question of a generation so the tradition can remain fresh and relevant to each time period and within each culture. In his confession, St. Augustine offers a prayer that tries to capture this presence of God in the midst of the uniqueness of our own historical period when he talks about God using the term beauty as ever ancient, ever new. Every generation has the thinkers that bring the wisdom of the tradition to the hearts and minds and questions and yearnings of that particular time period and the people who live in it. The Christian tradition in the U.S. has a long list of people who served in this capacity in the mid 20th century. Perhaps the most recognizable name one that influ has influenced Barack Obama the most is, is Reinhold Niebuhr, a great public theologian. Uh, and in the contemporary period, probably the most influential is an evangelical who started the Sojourners Movement in, in, and lives in DC, a fellow by the name of, of Jim Wallace. But within the Catholic tradition, we have people like this as well, and every tradition does. One of, one of the, the ones in the United States who is tried to rethink the Catholic tradition, particularly for women and the role that they play within the Catholic Church, is Sister Elizabeth Johnson, who's been under fire for years and years, but never gives up. And she's written great works about the environment. Uh, and then there's also a host of liberation theologies that are spread all over the world. Uh, the most key one probably in Latin America would be Gustavo Gutierrez, who kind of, kind of launched that particular way of trying to rethink the Christian tradition. My understanding, and I am not a scholar of Islam, I am an, I'm an appreciator, I'm a friend, I'm a student, but as I understand the great thinkers of Islam, I would put, from what I know, Hassan al-Banna in Egypt, Sayyid Nursi in Turkey, another generation uh, after Nursi, Fadullah Gulen, also of Turkey, who has uh, inspired an educational system that has great similarities to the vision of Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits, we're a Jesuit university at Seattle University and we're part of his progeny. Uh, and then more recently, the Swiss Islamic thinker Tarek Ramadan. 
The public of the academy doesn't come up with one pathway to religious renewal, they come up with many. And they debate chronically the relevance and faithfulness of, of these renewal energies and how to get these, how to renew our energies of our faith. The academy should also help every religious tradition come to terms with what Yugoslavian theologian Miroslav Volf has called malfunctions of faith. And media spends all of its time usually talking about the malfunctions of faith. They don't talk about faith itself, uh, the faith itself and lived out in a healthy way. This is when a religious tradition's beliefs and practices are twisted and perverted, obviously. These, these malfunctions abound in every religion, in every historical pre uh, uh, period, and treating them honestly is the only way to purge the religious tradition of their toxic effects. So within the Christian tradition, one of the, th the things that we've had to wrestle with and still wrestle with are all the malfunctions of faith that scattered through 2,000 years. The Crusades, the Inquisition, the Thirty Years' War, the dogmatic doctrinal battles of the, of the Reformation, the post-Reformation, and the post-Enlightenment periods, colonialism, and the unholy mixture of religion with militant nationalism and kind of unthinking laissez-faire economics. All of it is stuff that we spend a lot of time in the academy trying to sort out and try to make sense of as people of faith. Second public, religious community congregation. As a Jew, political science professor Michael Gottsegen is all too aware of the dangers of having one religion dominate a political culture. He believes the gradual privatization of religion in the U.S. through the 19th and 20th centuries has been a good thing for the most part. But he also celebrates the return of religion to politics because he notes that we have lost the bonds, and this is the way he puts it, quote unquote, the bonds of fellow feeling, or quote unquote again, the bonds of strongly felt peoplehood. And he believes congregational life is about the only place where we can help to reclaim that, or it certainly is one of the prime places. However, he doesn't think that most of our congregations are prepared to awaken the nation's bonds of fellow feeling, because most of our communities of faith think too small. Many are involved in faith-based direct service for some of the ills of society, and he praises that up and down such as starting or staffing soup kitchens and homeless shelters, but too few people of faith are trying to change the systems that actually create the poor, in his mind. He calls on rabbis and priests and imams to turn pious phrases into, quote unquote, deep and powerful and action animating sentiments for the common good, so that synagogues, mosques, and churches become schoolhouses for the cultivation of the love of, dedication to the common good much as the African-American Baptist women in the late 19th and early 20th century turned their houses of prayer into personal and social transformation centers. If we want to change our society, we need to change our congregations. Consider Asra Ol Namani, the Indian-born American Muslim journalist who was working with Daniel Pearl at the Wall Street Journal when Pearl was kidnapped in Pakistan in 2002. The news devastated Nomani so much, she returned to Morgantown, West Virginia, where she actually grew up, and, re and rediscovered her faith. She came to realize that she had abdicated her spiritual citizenship in the world, and she now tries to promote an interpretation of Islam that carries with it grace, compassion, and love. She is serving, whether you agree with her or not, as one of the people within a congregation who needs to renew the spark, the divine spark within these faith communities to, to try to re-energize our traditions. Third, family extended faith, co-workers and re relational networks. It is in our families and relational networks that we do most of our living. Several years ago, research started showing that when it comes to issues of public life, many of us who share common political and social values, whether we are Muslim, Jewish, Hin Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, or whatever, tend to see more eye to eye with each other than we do with many of the people we are praying with at our mosques, synagogues, temples, or churches. I can guarantee you that, that um, Jawad and I have much more in common than one of my cousins who lives in, in Fort Worth, Texas, and is a, a very conservative evangelical Christian. Um, if we are incapable of talking with those in our family systems about the important values in our lives, <clears throat> we will have no hope in achieving anything substantial in the common life of our society. 
Now this is often a frustrating venture, and there's recent research that suggests that for about 20 years, most of us have been, have been choosing not to have those conversations because frankly, they're just too uncomfortable. Um, however, we have to. So um, as far as what I'm trying to do for my part, the cousin that I have in Texas, uh, he takes his Christian tradition quite literally. And we argue a lot about faith and politics. I lived in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina hit, and I ended up, my wife and I ended up actually moving to Fort Worth and lived with him for five weeks, which I spent, I spent most of those five weeks in his hot tub in his backyard arguing theology. <laughs> but because we grew up as brothers, we can do that, and we can part friends, although it doesn't always feel like that sometimes, who still love one another. So when we, when we are together over the past few years, we've also talked about Islam frequently. He knows that I will do talks like this and that I have friends who are, who are Muslim. Uh, and I think he monitors a blog that I write uh, <laughs> because he will often engage me in conversations about things that don't fit into the conversations we're actually having, but he actually have to do with something I wrote. Um, after we've talked, Frequently, when he comes up here to visit, because uh, his sister lives in Gig Harbor, uh, he'll return to Texas, and for the next several days, he'll, begin, he'll text me four or five names, four or five uh, times a day, uh, quotations from the King James Version of the Bible to prove his point over mine. Now, if you know anything about the, K, the, the KJV, uh, the King James Version, it was uh, translated in 1611. That's like eight years before William Shakespeare died. There's some problems theologically with the translation, which I can't even get into with them because we have all these other issues. And there's like a 405 year chasm between the, the, the theology that he sometimes is grounded in and the theology that I'm grounded in. And I don't know if I'll ever get anywhere with my cousin, but I, I have no intention of ever ceasing to try. Because I know that as a public theologian, anything I may achieve in society is dependent upon my commitment in all of my publics. This is ironically uh, a passage, I think, in the Holy Quran that speaks of this, uh, actually dealing with women. O ye who believe, <clears throat> stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God, even if it may be against yourselves or your parents or your kin. In the Christian scriptures, we have something very similar. When Jesus, uh, Jesus of Nazareth says to his followers, from now on, five in one household will be divided three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Now you notice there's nothing in any of those verses that says anything about walking away from them permanently, only that we're gonna be divided. So with these three other publics, we can now talk about society. And I'll just say that some, a few brief things and um, and then, I and, I and then I'll wrap up. Um, it, if I'm wrestling with the wisdom of my religious tradition in the public of the academy, or places where my religious tradition does most of its thinking, and I'm wrestling with the, the wisdom of my religious tradition in the congregational life of my fellow believers, and lastly, with great patience and great courage sometimes, I am wrestling, uh, keep wrestling with the wisdom of my tradition and my relationship with family and extended family members and coworkers and people in my relational network, then I have some hope that the public good of religion in my life can influence the public good of society because I've moved out into society through these publics already. Miroslav Volf is an evangelical Christian who grew up in Croatia. Um, he served in the military for the old Yugoslavian government as it was falling apart. And as an evangelical Christian, he had to come to terms with the, with the strong Muslim uh, tradition that coexisted within the, uh, the Yugoslavian Republic. And you can see in, in Volf's writings, you can feel it almost, that he's wrestling with a certain understanding of his, of his religious heritage that has a hard time trying to make room for religious people of other traditions, and yet he knows deep in his heart that he also has to struggle to do that, uh, and he cannot, he cannot relinquish that struggle. He says this about taking the wisdom of our religious tradition into the public square. He says that there's three things that we have to do. First one is we have to cull our tradition for any part of the tradition that promotes human flourishing of all in society. 
and seeks to lessen all forms of human suffering and misery. The second thing we have to do is we have to sift through that same tradition to find basic principles that, that will speak directly to this human desire for human flourishing and, and discern how to translate these principles into our society's public language, using the nation's cherished concepts and images rather than that of our religious heritage. This is what King did. He used the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution, more than he did his own Christian uh, religious location. Um, but he did it masterfully because he took from his tradition important stories, significant, relevant stories. He took images. He took, he took various aspects of that tradition and wove it into a narrative that could engage the public, the broader public, and inspire the broader public. And if we want to impa impact society in significant and effective ways, we have to do the same thing. Lastly, because economics has penetrated literally every nook and cranny of our consciousness, and liberation for all of us will only occur if we can free ourselves from this over-materialized understanding of reality. Religious traditions, Vol says, must help societies transition from the love of pleasure to the pleasure of love. The love of pleasure to the pleasure of love. As people of faith, we got an inside track on what that means and how that operates in life. And that's part of what our society needs from us. We have to, and we're challenged as, as a rhetorical challenge. How do we persuasively talk about that? So let me say one final statement about how the private good of religion becomes a public good. One of the biggest challenges facing religions trying to engage the public square is in dealing with the forces of secularization. Some people, and we've hinted at that with, with previous speakers today, some people of religious faith assume that because of the religious instinct, people, uh, because we have a religious instinct, that people who are very secular in orientation and, and don't make a lot of room in their life for, for religious uh, insights or, or um, re religious um, p positions on different types of issues, that somehow deep down, they're asking big questions in life and the, and the kinds of que answers that they're asking can only be answered by our faith traditions. Uh, within the Christian tradition, evangelicals are particularly susceptible to this. It's assumed that these people intuit on some deep level kind of an emptiness, a God hole in their lives, and they're just waiting for somebody like us to come along and tell them what's missing in their lives. And there are certainly people for which that happens. Unfortunately, it's not that easy in our culture, particularly pretty much anywhere in the, in the developed world and increasingly in the developing world as well. Most people who are leading secular lives are not looking for answers that are, that, are, that are answered by religion. They don't think that their life is missing something, like on the second floor. <laughs> and they're not bothered by questions of the divine, for the most part. They live in what the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor calls an imminent frame. They're, they're trapped in the material reality that surrounds them. And that imminent frame uh, ends up pro prohibiting them from asking many of the questions that our religious traditions are so excellent at engaging us with. The God question is no longer a big issue for them. Instead, they have adopted what Taylor refers to as ex exclusive humanism, a way of being in the world that does not experience transcendence. Secularization not only makes it possible for unbelief, and this has been something we've been at for 200 years, becoming more secular. It not only makes it possible for unbelief, it also changes belief. And Taylor's argument is significant for anybody who wants to take their faith tradition into the, to the public square. Our faith is different. Our belief is different because of the, of the cultures and the time and history in which we grew up. He claims that whether we have faith or not, we, we are kind of caught in this cross pressure. He refers to it as cross pressure. I don't know if you can see that. But in order to, to hold ourselves together in this, this odd, narrow, imminent frame that we have, we've cre we create all kinds of ways of buffering ourselves. Some of it is just through distraction. We all have our cell phones. We can pull those out at any time. And I don't know if you noticed this, but on a, on a university campus, we're in a lot of meetings. And you're talking to a lot of people who talk for a living and like to talk for a living. So the rest of us have to sit and listen. And you ca I can't tell you how many times these things come out because we're buffering ourselves from, from but, but Taylor's argument is that our lives are just peppered 
with ways in which we're buffering ourselves from these cross pressures because we're trapped in this imminent frame at the bottom here. But we have experiences of transcendence because we're made that way. We transcend ourselves. We have ideas that, that touch us at the very core of our being and seem to pull us out of the way we think about life. We have new ideas. We have new feelings. We, we meet new people that, that inspire us. There's all kinds of tr transcendent things that are, pulling out, that are pulling out of us things that we didn't know we had. At the same time, we kind of live at a time, uh, a, a period of time in which for at least 100 years, we've been, the, the way a lot of uh, uh, fields refer to this is we've been going through a process of, of um, de-enchantment or disenchantment. That in, that in, that in the, the, the more ancient world, uh, we believed in unseen realities that enchanted everything around us. And it gave our life a, a, a rich, deep type of meaning. But that's gradually been uh, eroding around our life uh, in, in all of our cultures. He refers to it as, um, as fragilization, that it's actually make, it's made us very fragile, which is why we do this buffering, because we're so disenchanted with it. So if you really, <clears throat> for those of you, I don't see a lot of millennials here, but if you really want get to a, get a feeling of this disenchantment, um, I can recommend a couple, of, uh, a couple of music groups. Death Cab for Cutie, <laughs> The Postal Service, Fleet Foxes, uh, Arcades Fires. Uh, they're, they're, like, they're like a Kirk, they're like a, do some of you know them? The, the Kurt Cobain song. I mean, you can almost, it's almost like the songs are saying, wake up and smell the disenchantment. There, there, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, magical and mysterious about this reality. It's only what we have here. So Taylor <clears throat> says that in this buffered self, we have these cross pressures. And these, cro these cross pressures actually create something, the, the term he uses is really appropriate because we're almost at Halloween here. But the term he uses is that they haunt us. Because this, because this is his main point. And the reason he got interested in trying to figure all of this out, uh, Taylor had a, had, a, had a primary research question. His research question was this. 500 years ago, it would be almost impossible to find a human being who, who, who had serious doubts about whether God existed and had serious doubts about many of the certainties of life. The, the time frame in which we live, going through the 20th century and beginning in the 19th century, uh, first in the developed, the developed world, the northern hemisphere for the most part, increasingly everywhere else, you can't go anywhere without doubt. All of us are haunted by doubt. And that's the term he uses. These cross pressures haunt us. They haunt everyone, whether you're secular, whether you're religious. And it's at, that, it's at those moments of haunting that we actually have an opportunity to be able to engage people around the basic values and principles that our religious traditions have formed and taught us that give meaning to our life and that actually are a pathway we all believe and we all have lots of data to support it that will lead to a more just and humane world. So what I've done I got a couple of copies of these. I didn't realize there were going to be this many people here. Um, um, I tried to take, as a student of, of religion, I tried to take some of the values, some of the principles of the, the religious traditions, particularly of, the, of, of the, the religions of the book. And I tried to figure out a, a, at least a handful of them that we could actually begin to engage people with at the points of these hauntings, in, these, in all four of these publics in which we are involved in, they're all, everybody's being haunted. <laughs> and the principles of our faith tradition actually have, they have a beachhead. <laughs> they have an opening. They have a possibility of resonating with people in the mystery of the core of their spirits, if we can catch them at the right moment. For four years, I was a ca college campus minister at a state university, and one of the most creative definitions of campus ministry, and probably the most accurate I've ever heard, is that campus ministry in higher education is creative loitering. <laughs> and in a very real way, you loiter until something significant comes up in a young person's life, and then you're there. Because when they're haunted, you can be there to, to intersect with them at the moment of the haunting. Because our, ourselves are so buffered that, we're, that often those hauntings don't last long. They're fleeting moments. 
And so we have to make, we have to, we have to take the opportunities to do that. So with my cousin in, in Fort Worth, when I sit in a hot tub with him or when I sit around my kitchen table and I'm debating about religion and what it should be in this time, I guarantee you in the back of my mind, the thing that I always am asking myself when he brings up an issue, is Randy haunted by this? <laughs> because if he is, it's an opportunity for us to connect at a deeper level. And he can kind of see what I've spent my life kind of learning about, because I saw it when I was back in my, in my mid-20s, and I've been trying to figure it out ever since. And many of us who are in higher ed, that's how we got there, because we had something like that that broke through, and we've been spending our lives trying to figure it out. So the good news, if you look historically, um, we can move the needle on society, particularly in this country. We've done it many times as people of faith. The, the, the bad news is we live in a particular moment in which so much of the dross and dregs of the underbelly of this culture have risen to the surface. Now, that's bad in very many ways. The one good thing about it is that it's visible. Martin Luther King, what he used to say many times that the, that the racism in the North, in the United States, was far more pernicious than the racism, racism he encountered in the South. Because in the South, it was visible. You could address it, you could talk about it. In the North, they didn't think there, think there was a problem. So, thank you very much.